Let's start with the chief executive of the New Economics Foundation, Miata Fambula, for a roundup of everything that happened yesterday. Morning, Miata. Thank you uh, for your time here on LBC. Um, let's talk about that that split vote firstly, the, the sense that Boris Johnson succeeded in getting a second reading approved, but then immediately failed in terms of the timetabling, MPs voting down the programme motion that would have seen him have the time or indeed not need the time to get this through very quickly. What's your assessment of where we are? Yeah, so I mean, the Brexit horror continues. Um, So he did, you know, to be fair to the Prime Minister, he did get um, an agreement in principle from MPs to move on to uh, the sort of scrutiny uh, of the legislation, although it's actually really important to say that I think for some of uh, the MPs, particularly the Labour MPs that voted for second reading, that allowed him to get that majority of 30, they weren't necessarily backing his deal. They were just saying, we want to move to the next stage so we can scrutinise it and we can amend it if, if possible. Um, but a victory nonetheless. Um, and then essentially MPs said, rightly so, you're giving us three days to scrutinise this legislation that's going to have huge implications for the country and it's not enough time. Um, and we want more time. Um, And rather than saying, okay, we'll have a bit more time and that might require me to extend and flex my deadline until the 31st of October and beyond, um, the Prime Minister essentially decided to pause uh, the passage of the legislation through the House. So we are now in impasse. Limbo, purgatory, uh, Purgatory, whichever whichever noun you want at this point. Um, (laughs) In that group of MPs who said yes to the second reading but no to the timetabling, Their motivations, I think, are fascinating, aren't they? Do you think that they intend to attach amendments to this like a Christmas tree in the hope of of, of dragging the bill down, or do they genuinely wish to improve it? So I think it's mixed. Um, I think, you know, I think there were a lot of MPs, um, to their credit, who, you know, people like Oliver Letwin, who were probably going to support uh, the government's bill, but wanted the time to interrogate it and to scrutinise it. I think there are a set of MPs who generally want to put amendments because they're worried. And I think it's really important to be clear that this deal is very different to Theresa May's deal um, because it paves the way for a much harder Brexit than the one Theresa May has set up. Um, And it's basically signalling a move to uh, a much weaker trading relationship with the EU. a much weaker set of commitments on things like uh, protection of workers' rights and environmental standards. He actually took things out of Theresa May's withdrawal agreement that essentially says that, actually, I want a different path. I want a different type of Brexit. Um, And I think for some MPs, that will be hugely problematic. And so I suspect you would have got amendments around, for example, a customs union in order to kind of bind us a bit closer in terms of a trading relationship with uh, the EU. Um, And then I think you've got a category of MPs that, quite frankly, uh, do not believe that Brexit is the right course of action, and they will support any amendment that essentially thwarts um, that the momentum towards Brexit because they want the time uh, for their colleagues and for the country to reconsider this course of action. Now, the amendments that have already gone down to this, because we are in fairly un- uncharted territory here, it's my understanding that those amendments stay attached to this while this limbo period continues. If this comes back, do those amendments come back as well? I think they will do. Um, and I think, you know, Quite frankly, there are a set of amendments that uh, no matter what happens, MPs are going to try to put uh, on uh, the deal. And it's really important to say that actually they can't really change the withdrawal agreement itself because it's a treaty. But what they can do is attach amendments that essentially direct the the direction of travel, that forces the government Mm. down a course of action. So if there was an amendment on the customs union, for example, that essentially says when we get on to negotiating the future relationship, you must have a customs union rather than a very loose free trade agreement. Equally, something like um, a confirmatory referendum says, fine, we will have your deal, but you've got to take it back to the people. And I think those are the sorts of amendments that you're likely to see come forward. So we're now in this kind of limbo where the government, I mean, there was a lot of bluster around just pulling the deal completely. And in truth, what they've done is pause the deal um, and implored the European Union to only grant a short extension. It looks like the European Union are likely to grant an extension until 
the 31st of January, which is what MPs requested in the Ben Act, but give the Prime Minister the flexibility to say, look, if you can get your deal through Parliament sooner, then we'll leave sooner. Mm. Um, so that's probably where we're likely to be. The big question then is, does number 10 in that scenario say, OK, let's bring forward the bill, let's go through uh, the passage um, of the House of Commons and see where we get to and we'll fight off the amendments um, and we'll try and get this thing um, agreed to. Or do they, under, under this scenario, say, look, it's too risky to try and do that, given we know we're getting a barrage of amendments that mm. will lead to a version of Brexit we don't like? general election. One MP, Labour MP Paul Sweeney on Twitter in the last few hours saying the deal hasn't gone through, it was defeated on Saturday. He says the second reading yesterday was a vote on general principles of the bill before the committee stage. And then he says something quite interesting. I wonder what your view is on this. If amendments on customs union and public vote fail, then the government know they won't have enough support at the final stage vote. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think that's probably right. So, you know, I think it's, you know, the passage through the second reading has been hailed like as a great victory. But I think it was interesting listening to the debate because a lot of MPs made the point that we are going to vote for second reading not because we support this bill, but because we want it to go through scrutiny and because we want the chance to amend. Um, and it's not clear to me that once you go through that process of scrutinising the bill, where I think it will become eminently clear that this version of Brexit um, is a hard version of Brexit that will have an impact uh, on our economy, that will have an impact on MPs' constituents, um, but also, uh, you know, the, the, I suspect in that scenario what you're likely to see is some of the supportive principle that's being shown at the moment starts to move away. And if it's felt that they can't then carry amendments on things like a customs union and critically on a second vote... It's not clear that the kind of the tiny majority that may in principle exist now will withstand through to the end of the bill. Uh, and you mentioned the E word a few moments ago as well, Miata, the the election word. If we if we get into territory this week where Boris Johnson presses for a general election once again, does the opposition continue to wield the power of veto that it realizes it now has under the fixed term Parliament Act, or has it now been bounced into a position where with no deal seemingly off the table, and certainly by the 31st of uh, October, it's run out of excuses not to support an election. Yeah, so I think it makes it harder, because I think uh, the coalition um, of essentially Labour, the SNP, the Lib Dems, um, and some of the independents that's held up to this moment, as soon as the extension is granted and we're looking at a 31st of January deadline, um, then I suspect what you'll see is certainly the SNP uh, will be calling for a no-confidence vote because they've been very vocal about the fact that they think that the government is rotten, that they think that the Prime Minister has no confidence, has the confidence of the House um, and has no credibility and it should be brought down. And I think once they move... Um, and I think there's a question for the Liberal Democrats, who, quite frankly, if you're going to run a general election on a kind of no Brexit uh, stance, this is the best possible time to run, to run it. I think there'll be quite a lot of pressure for them uh, to essentially have a vote of no confidence against the government, which makes it very difficult for Labour not... Uh, to have that position as well. Um, and I think there'll be some pressure on the Labour side to say, look, let's delay, let's try and see if we can get um, a second referendum pushed through before we have an election. I think there's a kind of group of MPs that are pushing for that. But it's quite hard to see a world in which the government is challenging you. You don't like us, get rid of us. Yeah. You've got the SNP coming behind that. You've potentially got the Lib Dems coming behind mm. that. It's quite hard to see how Labour wouldn't then vote. Yeah. Well, the, the SNP are obviously in a hurry for an election, which for a variety of reasons they want to happen as quickly as yeah. possible. Uh, the Lib Dems, and uh, we, we might explore this with a Liberal Democrat later in the programme, uh, also would do quite well. These are the two parties, I think, that would improve their positions relative to 2017. The Labour Party could end up being annihilated in an election. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be a difficult election uh, all round, uh, not least, you know, uh, if Brexit hasn't been delivered. I think it will also be a difficult election for uh, Boris Johnson, but I think um, he has a better story to tell. Um, I think it will be a tough election for Labour because they're trying to straddle this position of trying to reconcile the views of um, 
remain uh, Labour voters and leave Labour voters, which is difficult because it means that no one's happy. And when you've got a very clear Brexit position on the Conservative side and a very clear Remain position on the Lib Dem side, I think it squeezes them. Um, so I think it's going to be a very tough general election, but I don't think it can be called. You know, I don't think anyone can predict, irrespective of what the polls say, where we will end up. Um, I fear, I fear that we may end up with a hung parliament again. Um, and I fear uh, we may have no more clarity about Brexit. Uh, and in the end, the only way in which we will solve and reconcile this and be able to move forward is when we take a version of the Brexit deal, you know, something that sets out the terms of Brexit, which we didn't have in the first referendum. And you give the country the option of that and remaining and you essentially leave the country to make the decision about the best course of action for the country.